Hi, it's Richard Dwyer. Today is May the 19th, 2021. Let's talk about the Kennedy assassination. Let's try to add a new dimension, a human element to some of the people involved, as well as to look at the adequacy of the evidence. In this video, I want to briefly talk about Ruth Payne, the circumstances under which Marina Oswald was living with her at the time of the assassination. I also want to touch on the assassination attempt on Edwin Walker, which many people believe shows the extent to which Lee Harvey Oswald would go for political purposes. Now, in my crime playlist on YouTube, there is a fascinating interview, it's a recent interview, of Ruth Payne, done by the Sixth Floor Museum at Dealey Plaza. Now again, Ruth Payne owned the home with her then-husband, Michael Payne, at which Marina Oswald stayed, and Lee Harvey Oswald slept the night before the November 22nd, 1963 assassination of John F. Kennedy. Now, at the time, Ruth was politically a liberal and a Quaker. She was 31 years old. She was separated from her husband of almost six years, Michael Payne. The two had lived apart for a year Right, which was required in the state of Texas at the time before Ruth could file for divorce, which she did on November 13th, 1963, just nine days before John F. Kennedy was assassinated. Now, according to Ruth Payne, and she says so in her recent interview by the Sixth Floor Museum, Lee Harvey Oswald, Marina's estranged husband, told Ruth Payne's estranged husband, Michael Payne, that John F. Kennedy was the best president of his lifetime. Let me repeat that. Lee Harvey Oswald told Michael Payne that John F. Kennedy was the best president of his lifetime. Now let's get the ages. The problem is we keep referring to these people as if they're abstractions, when they're actually real people of a certain age. Age-wise, Lee Harvey Oswald had just turned 24 years old the prior month before the assassination of John F. Kennedy. His wife, Marina, was just 22 years old. The couple had a one-and-a-half-year-old daughter, June Oswald, and on October 20th, 1963, just one month and two days before the assassination, Marina and Lee Harvey Oswald had a second daughter, Audrey. So understand, Marina Oswald had just given birth to Audrey and was raising the two girls at Ruth Payne's house. Right? Both women were estranged from their husbands. Oswald would visit on weekends. During the week, Oswald was staying at a rooming house at 1026 North Beckley Street in the Oak Cliff section of Dallas while he and his wife sorted through their marital difficulties. Oswald had been unemployed until Ruth Payne suggested that Lee Harvey Oswald apply for a job at the Texas School Book Depository, where a neighbor, Buell Wesley Fraser, was working. Now, on Oswald's behalf, Ruth Payne called the Texas School Book Depository and spoke with Roy Truly, 
Truly then asked her to have Oswald come down for an interview, which Oswald did. He got the job. Now let's try to be specific here. According to reports, Ruth Payne spoke with Roy Truly on October 15, 1963. Oswald interviewed with Mr. Truly later that day and was offered the job as a temporary employee. Oswald's first day on the job was the next day, October 16th, 1963. So he had only been an employee of the Texas School Book Depository for five weeks before the November 22nd assassination of President Kennedy. Now it is important to note that Oswald got the job at the suggestion of Ruth Payne, who had a neighbor who worked at the Texas School Book Depository. Oswald was not planted in the building by the CIA, the FBI, or by a foreign government. But let's also make another observation, and I believe this one is important. Oswald, excuse me, Oswald's family which included his wife, who had just given birth, and his two young daughters, were living with a political liberal, Ruth Payne. Oswald trusted the safety of his family in Texas with a liberal household, which was a rarity in the Dallas area during the 1960s. In her recent interview with the Sixth Floor Museum at Dealey Plaza, Ruth Payne finally referred to the 1963 March on Washington, at which Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. spoke. While there has been some talk about whether Oswald was really a liberal or was privately a Guy Bannister-friendly conservative, just keep in mind that his family lived in a liberal household. According to Ruth Payne, Oswald thought it was a good arrangement. Let me also point out that the entire time that Oswald, who would visit on weekends, spent time at the Payne's home, neither Ruth Payne nor her husband Michael had any idea whatsoever that Oswald was keeping a rifle either in the house or in the garage. Neither Ruth Payne nor Michael Payne ever saw Oswald with a rifle or had knowledge of Oswald storing a rifle at their residence. Now Michael Payne did see an elongated object covered by a blanket in the garage but he had no reason to believe that it was a rifle. The last night that Marina Oswald spent at the Payne house was the night President Kennedy was killed. After that night, she was moved by law enforcement to a new address. Ruth Payne and Marina Oswald barely spoke to each other after she moved. In her recent interview, Ruth Payne talked of visiting Marina once after her move out, but the conversation was strained. The stress of what had happened hovered. Now let's talk about Oswald's alleged attempt to assassinate a very conservative General Edwin Walker. I have problems with the official narrative. It is important to understand, to remind ourselves, that Lee Harvey Oswald did not have a driver's license and had no means that we know of in which to travel to General Walker's residence other than possibly by public transportation. We have no witnesses, none whatsoever, who claimed to have seen Lee Harvey Oswald traveling either to or from General Walker's house. 
We have no witnesses who saw Lee Harvey Oswald around General Walker's house at any time. Without preparation, how would Lee Harvey Oswald know where to hide and where to shoot? Let's keep in mind that General Walker was an accomplished military general who lived in a wealthy part of town, presumably one with adequate police protection. The idea of a shooter with a rifle being unfamiliar with the surroundings while trying to shoot through the window of a house doesn't seem realistic to me. There would have to be some level of preparation involving surveillance of the neighborhood and of the Walker house that would open up the possibility of witness identification of neighbors seeing a strange man in a wealthy neighborhood around the Walker house. We have no such witnesses. This is especially true since Lee Harvey Oswald would have been on foot as he did not have a car and did not have a driver's license. Let's also pay close attention to the timeline and let's ask ourselves whether Oswald had adequate time to practice with the rifle he purchased that was misaligned. We now know that the rifle had a problem with the alignment of the telescopic sight. According to reports, Lee Harvey Oswald receives the rifle and the revolver that he also ordered on March 25th, 1963. The Walker assassination attempt is supposed to have taken place on April 10th, 1963, just 16 days later. We simply don't have any evidence, let me repeat that, any evidence that Lee Harvey Oswald practiced shooting the rifle between March 25, 1963 and April 10, 1963. Again, a period in which he and his wife lived in an apartment and Oswald did not have a driver's license or car. Let me point out that when questioned by authorities after the assassination, Marina Oswald initially told them that Lee Harvey Oswald did not practice shooting the rifle. She then changed her story and said that Oswald had practiced shooting the rifle in January of 1963. The problem was he didn't order the rifle by mail order until March of 1963. Let's just say Marina Oswald's statements to law enforcement contradict themselves and in my opinion are unreliable. We simply don't have anyone else with knowledge of Lee Harvey Oswald practicing with the misaligned rifle. More importantly, there is a witness who saw the man leaving the Walker shooting Man, not man. Two guys. Neither of them resembled Lee Harvey Oswald. Folks, we have a witness. The men leave in separate cars. Separate cars. Lee Harvey Oswald could not drive and did not have a car. The actual eyewitness testimony does not conform with the Warren Commission narrative. That narrative is based on an alleged letter that Oswald wrote his wife Marina allegedly around the time of the shooting. The problem is that the letter is not signed by Oswald. The letter is not dated. And the letter 
does not mention General Edwin Walker. While the letter hints at Oswald planning to commit illegal activity, the activity in question is not identified. It is also important to note that the alleged target, General Edwin Walker himself, stated that the bullets recovered from the Kennedy assassination were not the same type as the bullet involved in his assassination attempt. His statements are even more striking than that. General Walker went further and claimed that the bullet from his alleged assassination attempt in the Warren Commission's possession was not the same bullet fragment that Walker himself handled at the time of the shooting attempt. Dallas police records support this contention as a Dallas police representative contended that the bullet fired at Walker was a steel jacketed 30.06 caliber bullet. Moreover, tests on the bullet show that it was made from a different lead alloy than the bullet fragments recovered from the Kennedy assassination. In sum, the evidence that Lee Harvey Oswald shot at General Edwin Walker is flatly contradicted by the eyewitness testimony of the, of the witness to the two individuals leaving the scene of the shooting. It is simply astonishing that the Warren Commission used the Walker shooting to argue that Oswald was a militant with a motive to kill President Kennedy, who was a liberal on the other side of the political spectrum from Walker. So what I want people to do here is to not trust anything I've just said. I want you to research the Walker shooting, right? Research it. Ask yourself, is it plausible that Oswald could surveil Walker's home without being noticed by neighbors in Walker's affluent neighborhood? Just ask yourself. We have eyewitness evidence of the people fleeing the scene right after the shooting. Why is that ignored? Where is the eyewitness evidence of Oswald fleeing the shooting? Also, we know that Oswald, who left home at 17, uh, was in the military, never had an opportunity to learn how to drive, right? Got out of the military, defected to Russia, where in the early 60s, not many people had cars. Oswald didn't have an opportunity to drive. Comes back to the United States, doesn't know how to drive, doesn't have a car. Isn't it a glaring hole in the Warren Commission narrative that the people leaving the Walker shooting, jump in cars that Lee Harvey Oswald, of course, did not have and could not drive. Isn't there also the inconvenience of Oswald leaving the scene of the crime with a rifle? How come no one recalls seeing anyone with anything resembling a rifle or a rifle case or some container, a duffel bag holding a rifle around the time of the Walker shooting, which, as you could imagine, made the news? So the fact that the Walker shooting features so prominently in the Warren Commission's papers is disturbing. This evidence doesn't support its use by the Warren Commission. It's unreliable. 
Understand too, Marina was not with Oswald at the Walker residence at any time. I would also argue that Marina Oswald, who doesn't believe, by the way, that her husband killed the president, was less than consistent in her statements to law enforcement. Right? This was a 22-year-old in a new country who no doubt was thinking about her children. She's a mother for the second time, just one month before the shooting. Right? I get the feeling that in the stress of the moment, especially with this group who, let's face it, the Kennedy assassination is filled with witnesses who claim that they were misquoted, that they weren't given a full opportunity to tell everything they knew. Right? Given that pattern, I just don't get the feeling that what Marina Oswald told authorities should be trusted completely given that many of her statements, especially her statements concerning the Walker shooting, as well as Lee's practicing with the rifle that he doesn't get until March, are inconsistent with other facts we know, such as the eyewitness who saw the two people who left the Walker shooting. That's how I see it. Let me hear from you. I hope you leave your comments in the comment section of this video. In sum, the Warren Commission's heavy reliance on the Walker shooting makes the Commission's findings less credible. That's how I see it. I look forward to reading your thoughts in the comment section of this YouTube video. Thanks for stopping by.